Am I recording? Let's see. Mm. Yes. All right, wonderful. Good evening, everybody. This is Medical Terminology, MED 120, Tuesday evening lecture. I am your host, Dr. Garias. That's me right here. Much younger, much thinner. And it is Tuesday, November 3rd. This is now week four. So um, as stated in our syllabus on day one, week five is our midterm. So our midterm will be held at 6 p.m. Tuesday, November 10, and it will be performed online. Now, what does that mean? It means that um, anything that we've gone over weeks one through four, this lecture included, is fair game. Any word that we went over, and um, I'm also gonna put, um, let's see if I put it already. I'm gonna put a practice uh, exam. Well, it's not really a practice exam. It's not for a grade or anything like that. I'm just gonna show you what um, one of my midterms look like. And please do not ask for the key. Uh, that's your job to figure out what the answers are. But just to give you the flavor, it's typically 50 items, multiple choice. So, uh, and um, it covers weeks one through four. So today's lecture included. And after I go over, um, um, some of the words for today. Um, uh, we're going to go over um, the type of questions that could come out. And, and if you look at the, um, the midterm that I'm going to post on it, um, the, uh, the practice test, um, you'll, you'll see that it's very straightforward. Now, as a quick reminder, what was due today? Anything that was uh, module three or our week three items is due today because it is now module four, week four. So um, we will not have a discussion that's due next week. So it'll free you up to, uh, to have more time uh, to study. But what are we doing today? We are doing uh, chapter six, GI system, also known as the gastrointestinal system. Gastro meaning stomach, intestine, meaning your, of course, the extra tubes of your large and small intestine. So uh, I could ask you a word like this. What does is, what is, uh, gastrointestinal mean? Does it mean A, pertaining to the stomach, B, pertaining to the intestines, C, both A and B, D, none of the above? And of course, you have a connecting vowel here. It means both the study of the stomach and the intestines. Okay. Um, but um, just to keep you honest, your medical ma uh, medical language lab is uh, is due next week, of course, for your uh, chapter six. So let's jump right in. Open up our textbook. Let me get this link. Uh, copy the link. For all you. Um, um, what is this thing called again? Uh, it's uh, Firefox. For all of you Mac users, you know that um, Safari is not geared for your medical language lab. So we're just going to jump right in, going to our e textbook. And we're going to look for here in the table of contents, chapter six. Digestive system. And we will go to chapter six. So, like our uh, objective state, we have to talk about the types of medical treatment and the people in our neighborhood. So GI medicine, or gastrointestinal medicine is the subspecialty of the department of IM, internal medicine, and they're good at gastrointestinal medicine, GI med. Also, they are known as gastroenterologists. So entero means uh, your intestines, gastro is your stomach, and the O is the combining vowel that brings these two root words together. And logis is the person who, of course, uh, practices or who's the specialist at it. So it's a it's a um, sub sub specialty. And they are really good at uh, scoping people. 
which is this word right here, endoscopy. Now, just real quick, looking at the anatomy, uh, you have upper GI parts. So it's everything from uh, the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, all the way up through your stomach and through your mouth and your oral cavity and through your pharynx, which is your throat. All of this, the stomach and your esophagus and all of this is upper GI. Lower GI is everything from the duodenum on down. Then you have these accessory organs like the gallbladder, the liver, uh, and the spleen. So all intents and purposes, it's just one big tube. Okay? So knowing that, let's talk about all the stuff that's in the upstairs or the upper GI. So let's start with the oral cavity. Dent Dento means teeth. So the dentist, of course, is a person is skilled and studies the teeth. Dentition is um, the state or condition of your teeth. Now, let's look at dont. That's also teeth, but an orthodontist says something totally different. So you can see here, ist is the suffix, orth is the prefix, and, and dont or odont is the root. Now, orth means to straighten out. So dentist deals with a bunch of uh, diseases, diagnosis of your oral cavity, but it is the orthodontist is uh, typically deals with the misalignment of your dentition or your teeth. Of course, gums, which hold your teeth together, that's itis, inflammation or infection of, know and understand the five cardinal signs and symptoms of inflammation and infection. So that's itis, gingiva is your gums. So um, itis, of course, inflammation or infection of your gums. And it is now a scientific fact with data that um, there are <clears throat> severe gingivitis or severe gum disease. There is a direct correlation with that and uh, risk for cardiovascular disease, especially risk for myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Your tongue, you see glosso and lingual, okay? They're both together. Doesn't that look like a beautiful both A and B question? So you lump that together. Hypoglossal. So your hypoglossal nerve <clears throat> has to be the nerve underneath or below your tongue. Hal pertaining to hypo, um, beneath and gloss is your your tongue. So if my patient has glossitis, that means they have an inflammation or infection of their tongue. And the hypoglossal nerve is the nerve that's underneath the tongue. Another way to say underneath the tongue, because we also have um, cardiac medication that we put underneath the tongue, and that is called sublingual. And um, we put that medication Al pertaining to underneath the tongue. Now it's really neat. Sublingual meds are really neat. They they bypass your liver regarding um, uh, metabolization. So the effects are felt much, much quicker than it would if you just tried to swallow the pill. And that's uh, what's neat about um, sublingual meds. Mouth, oral pertaining to the mouth. Stomat, we already know stoma. Um, when, we were, um, uh, when we were talking about tracheotomies or creating a stoma or mouth or a hole or opening. A stomatopathy, that's a disease. Hmm, hold up. Let me, why does this sound familiar to me? Did we just, hmm. I'm getting deja vu. Did we go? Did we go over this last week? Why am I getting deja vu? Maybe I taught this so many times that it's familiar. You guys remember last week? Did we go over this last week? It seems ridiculously familiar. Or maybe it's also because I also had a GI medicine, uh, um, anatomy and physiology. Uh, we were going over similar things, but. Gang, stop me or, or write in the chat. Stop me if we had this lecture already. But um, I'm just going by. Let's just check one more time. I'm a little bit paranoid now. 
Okay, so we did chapter one and two, then we did cardiovascular, then we did respiratory last week, and it's this week four, and I click on four, and it's GI. Hmm. Yeah, okay, I'm just being paranoid. Alrighty, <clears throat> so that is, all of this is your oral cavity, al pertaining to your uh, mouth or uh, uh, um or the cavity or the hole that uh, precedes your pharynx and esophagus. Now your esophagus is your food tube. Us or you us, us or um, that is um, means structure of. So structure, the esophagus is the structure of, of the tube that carries food from your mouth or your oral cavity to your stomach. And remember what we, talked about a second ago, who are the masters and mistresses of the scope or the instrument of examination, the esophagus scope, that is um, GI med or gastrointestinal or gastroenterology, either one. You could also a uh, pharynx, pharyngo, so pharyngotonsillitis, so my patient not only has inflammation and infection of their tonsils, but they have inflammation and infection of their pharynx or their throat. Just got gastroscopy, that's pretty uh, straightforward. And remember, gastroscopy versus gastroscope. The scope is the actual instrument. Scopy, I want you to remember that Y on the end, that means it is, um, it is a process, so process of viewing. And it is the gastroscopy, that is the thing that you're trying to schedule. You're not scheduling a gastroscope. It sounds very awkward. That's like, you know, bringing your car to the shop and saying like, I'm, uh, oh, I want to schedule, I want to schedule an automobile. It's just kind of odd. Uh, now your pylorus, that is a part of your stomach. Your stomach has these circular muscles called sphincters. Sphincters are these valves that make sure that, you know, that it becomes water and airtight so that things don't go in or out unless we want it to go in or out of the stomach. And the pyloric sphincter or the pylorus structure of the sphincter in the lower part of the stomach, let's look at that picture, is this thing right here. See how this like little band of muscle here? And what you don't see here is your, um, what they call the cardiac sphincter. It's not because it has anything to do with your heart, but, um, it, uh, it is the main door that goes into your stomach from your esophagus. So you have the cardiac sphincter here, also known as the esophageal sphincter, and you will have your pyloric sphincter down here. Now, if you have any problems with the sphincter and it doesn't keep the acid in here, the acid, uh, if it comes up here, will shoot up, and that is called gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, and we're gonna break down that word um, later this evening as well. So if I do a pylorotomy, what am I doing? I'm making a little incision there in the lower portion of the stomach. And because it's usually uh, to loosen up the area, um, um, probably due to obstruction or due to adhesions. Adhesions are like, like that's the best way to put it. Every time you cut into somebody's skin, it's going, or some, some mucosal lining or the, in, the inner lining of the human body, it's gonna cause scar tissue. So sometimes we use the pylorotomy to alleviate some of that car, scar tissue. Usually from either uh, acid damage like in an ulcer or um, damage from previous surgery. Suffixes. Algia means pain. We've already seen that before. So gastralgia is um, stomach ache. Gastrodynia is also stomach ache. So, you know, a pain in your tum tum. That's uh, both A and B. Gastralgia and gastrodynia. Hyperemesis. Some of you ladies may have experienced that when uh, you had uh, children, right? You may have uh, uh, been vomiting too much. Emesis or emesis, potato, potato, right? Um, hyper means too much. So hyperemesis, uh, too much vomiting. If you have hyperemesis gravidarum, 
you've had too much vomiting during your pregnancy. Enlargement. Now, this is abnormal enlargement. It, it's not like just an itis. It means that that body part is just growing very large and uh, out of hand to the point where it starts impinging on things. Because if you, if, if you take a good look at this, the human body, everything has its own place. So nothing should be growing out of size. So for example, if I had splenomegaly, there's not a lot of play, space here for the spleen to go. Gastromegaly, there's not a lot of space where the stomach can grow. Because once you're an adult, you're an adult, you shouldn't be, there should be extra parts of you that are growing out of hand. And that's what a megaly is. You can also have cardiomegaly, which is abnormal enlargement of the heart. You can also have, oh, let's just write this down since I'm talking about some megalies. Let's talk about acromegaly. Okay, uh, abnormal enlargement of the hands and feet, usually distincted of uh, some sort of pituitary tumor uh, and uh, it's going to upgrade your growth hormone. But the funny part is it's just going to make your hands and feet grow and then give you arthritis. No bueno. Um, anorexia. Anorexia is simply um, ia, state or condition. Orex means, of course, ap appetite or what you put in your aura, mouth. And means without or no or not. So it actually means a state of condition of no or without um, appetite. Now, anorexia could be just normal, like you're sick. Because you're sick, you don't, you don't, who has a good appetite when they're sick? Or maybe you have some anxiety states. If you're anxious, are you in the mood to eat something? Generally, no. And uh, maybe you heard of this by watching, I don't know, Hallmark after school specials. I know I watch them. State or condition of no or not uh, eating or uh, more specifically appetite or the wish to eat. You may have a person who has anorexia nervosa. Osa is like a plural for osis or abnormal condition of nerves. So this is a psychiatric disorder where the person believes that um, it's usually body dysmorphism Ism is a stator uh, um, process of, and dis is abnormal, morph is shape. So process of abnormal shape. So these patients, no matter how much weight they lose, um, they will not eat because they will look at themselves in the mirror and they, they'll think they're ugly or they're a monster. And that's where anorexia nervosa comes in. And it's not only teenage girls, it, it's also teenage boys, it's also adult males, adult, adult females. Anorexia nervosa and generalized anorexia is part and parcel of major depressive disorder and also, also part and parcel of anxiety states as well. So anorexia, think generalized term. Dyspepsia, ia, state or condition. Dys means abnormal, bad, painful, difficult. Peps means um, um, digestion. And that's what we're doing when we eat, right? Maybe you heard me crunching on some Doritos about a minute uh, before uh, uh, we had the lecture. Um, I know I'm bad, but I'm on campus and there's nothing else to eat. That's my excuse. Dyspepsia. Um, peps is digestion. And that's what you're doing when you're eating. You're digesting it, you're breaking it down, you're metabolizing it. You're changing the thing that you eat into eventual oxygen and fuel. But there could be dyspepsia, like if you eat a bad street taco, it's gonna go down, but it's gonna go down hard. And then you'll have uh, epigastric pain, which is a region of your stomach. This is right underneath your solar plexus, uh, right underneath your uh, chest. Um, remember we talked about the cardiac sphincter, you could have some heartburn right? Now dysphagia, 
Phagia, state of condition, dis of abnormal, bad, painful, difficult. Phage means eating or swallowing, dysphagia. And diarrhea, discharge or flow of watery stools. Why am I reading it? You guys know what diarrhea is, but let's break it down because it's kind of important. Diarrhea is kind of dangerous, actually, especially with the very old and very young. So rhea means uh, excessive flow. And then we already learned the term dia means complete or thorough. Okay, so it's a complete or thorough excessive flow. Now, what does our body do? We take food and then we go down here and it gets processed. And then inside our small intestines, this part here, nutrients are supposed to be absorbed. And inside our large intestines, this big part here, water is supposed to be um, um, absorbed. Now what happens if I eat a really greasy, nasty street taco? I know I'm picking on street tacos. So this covers it with bacteria and fat. So if it's laden with bacteria and fat, can water go in? Nope. So water is going to go right down all the way to the end of the colon. Now can all those nutrients that I need, right? All the proteins, amino acids, uh, sugars, all the things I need, that will also go in the toilet. Hence the term diarrhea. Dia, complete or thorough. That means all the water that you just intake, all the food and nutrients that you had just intake, because even with the, even with the street taco, right, there's some nutrients that we want out of it. And diarrhea is dangerous because all of that doesn't get absorbed. All of that ends up in the toilet. And if that ends up in the toilet, what happens? My patient is in danger of dehydration. And for the very young and the very old uh, patient profiles, it gets really dangerous, okay? All righty, stomat, oro, let's see. Let's just look around, see if we got anything. Itis, algia, we got that down. Oh, here's, a, here's an also another way to look at your future anatomy physiology class. You wanna look for your sublingual gland? That's gotta be the, a gland that's underneath your lingua, your tongue. You know when they say you are bilingual, means you have two tongues or you speak more two or more languages. Submandibular, your mandible is your uh, jawbone. So that's got to be the, um, the gland that's right underneath my mandible or my jawline. And the parotid gland, oh, there's no way to remember that. It's the one that's in your cheek. Okay, rhea, rhea, uh, tylo. Let's see. Tylen, or uh, deals with saliva. So if I have, uh, or silo also uh, de uh, deals with saliva. So this uh, hypersalivation or hypersialosis, uh, hypertylism, that just means excessive saliva. So we get that below, hypoosis, we got that down. Logist, we got that down. I'm just looking at these boxes, random, see, seeing if there's anything we, uh, toothache, odontalgia, right? That's nice. But no one calls it that. Even dentists don't call it that. Toothache is too, toothache. Periodontitis, itis inflammation or infection of surrounding my teeth, which is uh, similar to gingivitis, it's the same thing, all intents and purposes. Um, uh, let's see, anything good? Oh, here's those sphincters I was talking about. And these are ulcers. And another word for ulcer, just it's just a hole. Um, your stomach lining uh, started wearing away in a certain area, doesn't have enough mucosal lining or, or, or mucus to protect it. And then the, the, um, the hydrochloric acid, pH 1, eats right through this thing and it, you can get a nice ulcer. And depending on where the ulceration or the hole is, that's where they get its name, esophageal ulcer, right? And this is your, near your esophage, esophagus and your esophageal sphincter. There's a duodenal ulcer that's in the, um, the tube of the duodenum after this um, pyloric sphincter right here. Okay. Mm, 
Uh, let's look, look. We already talked about CA cancer, something that's carcinogenic. Gen, creation of, carcin, think cancer. And the only way we know about cancer is post biopsy. So just because something has an OMA in it, OMA just means tumor. But you add carcin to it, and you definitely know you have a, uh, a serious, serious cancerous tumor. Sarcoma, fleshy tissue, highly malignant tumor. That's, OMA. that's, the, that's a scary type of OMA. Epigastric, hypermesis, yada, 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 yada. Okay. And it's neat. And I, I also believe, uh, I'll even show you, there's like this master list of all the words in the chapter that's also at the end of every chapter. So you, you could look at, look at that and then mix and match um, the words and the word parts because all intents and purposes, next week's exam is only, it's only gonna ask you, do you know what this part is? Or do you know what this means? That's it, that's the worst I could do to you. Now, uh, your small intestine is made out of three parts, your duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. First part, duodenum, second part, jejunum, third part, ileum. And in general, intestines, um, typically, usually they talk, when they talk about the small intestine, they call entero, but it goes entero, means all intestines, but when we use entero, we're typically uh, talking about the small intestines and we use the word colo or colon when we typically talk about the large intestines. So that's the duodenum, jejunum, ileum. That's part of the enterology, right? Study of your intestines, typically your small intestines. You can have enteropathies, raphe, suturing, stomy, we can create a hole if, or a port if we need. Now the large intestine, again, we're the, all of this is part of the lower GI. If I wanna remove my appendix, I would perform an appendectomy, probably secondary to appendicitis. And remember, we're not concerned about the appendicitis or the inflammation or infection of the little thing that's sticking out of our large intestine. Where is it, where is it, where is it? See this, it's sticking out. This is part of your large intestine. And it's sticking out, it's called an appendix, just like an appendix in a book, that extra chapter that's sticking out all the way in the end. Colostomy, uh, we wanna create a, a hole or an opening in your colon. We usually do this if there's a cancer or surgery coming up. Colonoscopy, of course, we scope. This is the process of scoping or visual examination of your colon, also known as your large intestine. Proctologist, that's a sub, sub, sub specialty. So you wanna be a proctologist and be the expert at anuses and rectums. And the rect anus is the sphincter that's at the end of the colon. But the rectum is the last tube. Let's see if I gotta have a picture of that. See, right down here, where you see that is your uh, anus or the anal sphincter. Now the tube that's connected straight up to it right before it gets to the sigmoid section of your large intestine, that is your uh, rectum. So rectum, think tube, anus, think sphincter. You could have a rectocele, right? Where uh, the part of your rectum is herniated or sticking out. So let's say, for example, let's say this was a female patient who had like nine kids. What's gonna happen to any tubing that's down here? It's gonna get loosened up. And then the muscles of the pelvic floor, which typically entrap and hold all these tubes together, gets weak and then this will prolapse. So this part will go boop. It'll go outside and stick outside, kind of like a bizarre tail. And you could actually push it back in. And then if you have your patient do a Valsalva maneuver or have them brace down, you know, like, uh, like they're going to the bathroom, this thing will go boop, or you make them laugh, it will boop and it'll pop right back out. And that's not good because now the outside is now, the outside is, the inside is now outside. And that's a, that's a serious cause for uh, uh, infection. 
Also, no one wants to experience that. You don't, you won't want your rectum on the outside. Um, Ninonosophy, incision, what else, what else, what else, what else? Oh, here's different types of colostomies that we use. So if there's a intest intestinal obstruction, obstruction, I'm gonna put a, a colostomy a port here, right? Or if there's excision of a diseased or cancerous section, right? You can put a colostomy. And a colostomy bag is the bag that captures all uh, the waste. It's still kind of, uh, it still needs improvement, the design of most colostomy bags. They still open up. Peristalsis, peri means surrounding. Your food tube is surrounded by a bunch of circular ringed, a ring of circular muscles. So it goes, it's the way that you, when you swallow uh, food, you actually have no control. Everything goes on automatic. And we'll talk more about that in your anatomy and physiology class. And that automated um, uh, muscular reaction to put food, to, to kind of like uh, move food down towards your stomach, that's called peristalsis. And of course, if you vomit, that's reverse peristalsis. Can you control your swallowing? No, you cannot. Can you control vomiting? No, you cannot. So don't try. My kids always try like, I'm okay. And then always try to hold it. It'll, you'll never win. You'll eventually vomit. Uh, ascending, descending, transverse colon. Let's look back at that picture. So right here is ascending, transverse, descending colon. Then there's an S-shaped part here. That's your sigmoid. And then the last tubing before it hits the anus, that is your rectum. Um, structure of. Oh, here's another one. And here's your appendix. Up, across, down, sigmoid, anus, out. Okay, and you could scope. Uh, and you could do a sigmoidoscopy. I'm only gonna do it here to the level of the sigmoid, right? Or the lower third of the colon. Or I could do a colonoscopy, means the whole shebang. The whole large intestine. Here's the good thing and bad thing about lymph vessels. Um, maybe I lectured this to you guys, maybe I didn't. But this green stuff, it's not green in real life, but we color it green just so we know what we're talking about. Those are your lymph, these are your lymph nodes and your lymph vessels. The function of the lymph nodes and lymph vessels is for immune function uh, with alongside with the arteries, and this is an artery and vein. The vein is not pictured here. But alongside the arteries and veins, they provide um, excess fluid for your arteries and veins. And they also provide another alleyway or another transport system for white blood cells and also immuno immunologic products. But you could see here, you could have metastasis, METs. Metastasis will then move from one tumor to another tumor, and then the cancer will now spread to other organs. And that's typically stage four or end stage disease. That's never good when, oh, when, when cancer starts to spread. And when cancer starts to spread from one location to another, it's called metastasis. And the slang for it's METS. And when you look at the word metastasis, stasis means to stand in one place and meta means to change. So you're changing from standing in one place, changing or moving from standing in one place or standing still. And that's what metastasis or metastasis is. And we call it METS for short. Or when you hear the word stage four, stage four cancer, that means the cancer moved from its primary site and it's now spreading. And if it's a malignant tumor, it means it's spreading very fast. And the way we can do that, we look and identify the lymph nodes and how many lymph nodes are affected and to what extent. Okay, here are the uh, words for um, uh, some of your accessory organs. Now your, um, let's look at, I gotta do a little bit of an anatomy uh, of your bile duct and all that stuff.
So if you look at this, this is your pancreas, this is your duodenum, your liver, and your gallbladder. Your, gall, your liver makes this stuff called bile. Bile is like, um, is like a, um, it's an emulsifier. It breaks down fat to smaller fat particles so that you can digest it. Now, the gallbladder then has these, uh, these pathways, common hepatic duct, cystic duct, and all, all this, and common bile duct, all these. This, just know that there's, there's, a, there's a system of uh, uh, pipes that go through here, and, it's, and it works with the, um, the pancreas, liver, all these guys work together. Now, so that's what these things are. So a cholangiol is a very, very small bile vessel or a tube that goes, uh, that goes into or surrounds my, um, my, bile, my gallbladder. Now, chole means bile or gall. So if I had a cholelith, that means I have a gallstone or a calculus and it's a piece of hard material that I, it's not only hard, it's sharp, and then it cuts and damages whatever it floats around against. Your gallbladder itself is cholecyst. So if I had a cholecystectomy, I am actually ectomy in the process of re removing the gallbladder. And that poor person will be on a um, low fat diet, low to, low to no fat diet for the rest of their lives. Bile duct, colitico. So I could do an incision to open it up or maybe to uh, do, you know, to inspect the other parts of the, uh, of this uh, gallbladder system. And that's called a uh, colitocotomy, tomy to cut into. So we're not taking anything out in a colitocotomy. We're just, you know, we're just uh, inspecting all the tubing and we're gonna sew it back up in the end. Of course, inflammation or infection of your liver is hepatitis. Inflammation or infection of your pancreas is pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is very, very scary and can kill you overnight. So this is something we don't play with um, because the pancreas has enzymes in it. And if the pancreas uh, starts either beginning diseased via pancreatitis inflammation or infection or pancreatic uh, CA or carcinoma, um, it starts releasing the enzymes and the enzyme starts attacking things in our body. And one of the enzymes that gets released kind of like shutting down our heart. So it's never a good thing. My last pancreatitis patient, uh, all she had was complaining of stomach ache, low grade fever around 10 p.m. She was dead by 4 a.m., 5 a.m., something like that. Because um, all the enzymes in the pancreas started releasing into the bloodstream and it started latching onto the heart and then then it starts telling the heart to go shut shut down. That's the easiest way to say it. Cholelithiasis, say that eight times fast. Cholelithiasis, iasis means abnormal condition, chole, bile or gall, and litho means stone or calculus. So calculus, that's a hard math. And what's a stone? Something hard. I always remember, that's how I remember calculus or stones. Whoa. Uh, hepatomegaly, we already talked about uh, splenomegaly. Now, post and preprandial. Uh, al pertaining to or EL pertaining to, prand means um, meal. So if my patient has postprandial pain, it's the pain after uh, they ate a meal. If it's preprandial, it's um, before they had their meal. Periprandial, as they're having their meal. Okay, so know the know this because this is good for when talking about pain states and also talking about dyspepsia and also talking about um, medication administration. Okay, hepatitis. Oh, here's another picture of the gallbladder and all the ducts. You can see it's um, can it's it's intimate with your liver here. Here's your falciform ligament. It's connecting your liver to the, uh, your abdominal wall. Mm, pancreatic duct. See, oh, here's, here's another picture. So cholangitis, these ducts would get inflamed. A cholangiol would be these little tiny little ducts. Mm, 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 mm. 
Let's see. Anything else? Mm, nope. Okay. Let's go through these abbreviations real quick. BE, barium enema. Uh, that's when we put these contrast material or the stuff that makes, um, it makes your, uh, your x-rays more defined. Here's an example. Let's show you what that looks like. We put an enema, we put this tube in your anus and up your rectum. And you see how it'll make everything glow in the dark. A normal x-ray would be like this. You can't see it. But then with barium, it becomes hyperechoic. And you could see, ooh, look at here in his um, descending colon, there's stricture. See how it's all thin? And everything else is all nice and wide. Okay. Uh, BM, bowel movement. That means they did number two. BMI, body mass index. Now, body mass index, we don't use that as much anymore. But yes, we can. Eh, because um, there's other things. And BMI, there's like a little formula for it. It's like height in centimeters divided by your weight in kilograms squared, something like that. Cancer, we talked about CT, computerized tomography. A CT scan is, um, um, it's, it's, in, it's a multiple x-ray. And this is your gastrointestinal area. And uh, um, the CT scan, it takes like multiple films of your body. And this is the transverse view. It's like cutting you in half. You take multiple films and then you put it together. And then it, it shows a whole bunch of uh, things like this in sequence and different layers. And it's um, created by x-rays and a computer um, organized all those x-ray signals into a, something that we can look at and we can interpret. Uh, DX is diagnosis, we already know that word, EGD, esophago gastroduodenoscopy, right? Or an upper GI series. But we most likely call it upper GI. But here it means what? I'm scoping the esophagus, the food tube, the stomach, and, a, and the first part of the intestine, or the duodenum. Essentially, this 25 cent word is very simple. Uh, and also, it just means upper upper GI series. That's the easiest way to put it. Extra corporeal or corporeal potato potato shockwave lithotripsy. Say that eight times fast. Tripsy now. Tripsy is the process of crushing or destroying litho, which is um, stones. So extra corporeal means extra means out of. Corpo means body. So this machine works from outside of your body. It sends these shock waves uh, through the table or some sort of like, um, let me show you the best way to put it. Instead of trying to explain to you. So you're on this table. You're on this table and then um, there's like a transducer here and it sends shock waves from outside your body into your body and then it breaks up all the stones so that they can least pass. Because if they're too big, they get stuck. FBS or FBG is fasting blood sugar, also known as fasting blood glucose. We already talked about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Re means to go back. Flux means to flow. So your food should be flowing downwards. But you know when you've had a really, really bad speed taco, what happens? The acid starts kicking back up and then you get heartburn, severe heartburn. And it's not really burning your heart. It's burning the upper uh, esophageal sphincter, also known as your cardiac sphincter of your um, stomach. Because um, uh, if that valve isn't tight, all the acid, which is highly acidic, inside your stomach will start damaging that area. It can also start damaging the area to the point where you can even get cancer. That's called a Barrett's esophagus, 
that's for uh, severe alcoholics. GI, IBD, IBS, really serious stuff. Inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. Just imagine if you had a massive inflammation or infection of your, of your bowel, your large and small intestine. You just have a heck of a time. They have a lot of flatus or uh, farts, gas, they all, and it's to the point where it's painful. And uh, they also go to the bathroom a lot. Um, they have a lot of uh, bowel movement. They have a lot of diarrhea. So there's a risk for uh, dehydration. And it's just, it's not only embarrassing, it's, it's, it's quite debilitating and painful. IV intravenous, that's how we can get some meds. LES, uh, UES, upper esophageal sphincter, lower esophageal, lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, nasogastric tube or NGT. It's a tube that we put it down your nose and then it'll go all the way down your esophagus or to your stomach. OR is operating room, that's easy. Peptic ulcers disease or PUD. Ruin Y, gastric bypass, eh, not so much. Now, RUQ, LUQ, let's look at the, this is like a review from um, chapter two. It was in my um, chapter two lecture. But let's look at the quadrants. Because this is also a nice chapter two review. So RUQ, RLQ, LUQ, LLQ, that's easy. And remember, when you're looking at a diagram or you're looking at your patient, you look at, you look at, the, you look at the picture of the diagram from the perspective of the patient, not your perspective. So the left part is here, not over here. This is your patient's left. This is your patient's lower left. So this is easy, RUQ, RLQ, LUQ, LLQ. That's easy. This, uh, it's a little bit, a uh, little bit more. But when you look at this, you can see the left and the right are the same exact thing, and then the middle is just the middle, right? It's different. So we all know where our belly button is, is right here. So that's the umbilical region. Now epi means right on top of. So the epigastric region is right on top of here, right underneath your breastbone, and the hypogastric region, right? And so we have an epigastric region here. The hypogastric region is underneath. Now, how to break down your left and right. Know that the left and right are the same. It's just uh, um, um, making sure that you're looking at it at the perspective of your patient. So hypochondriac. Hypo means underneath. Condor means rib cage. So the hypochondriac area is underneath the rib cage. Left lumbar or loin. Lum or lumbo means loin, or where would you wear your loincloth? Right here at the level of your waist. Where's your lumbar or lower back? Right here at the level of your waist. And your ilium or iliac legion, that's your bikini line right here. So you have your left and you have your right ilium or right iliac region where your hip is. So could I easily do this for you? Well, I typically would do it for you more in anatomy and physiology where I could go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Uh, um, tell me where the umbilical region is. Tell me where the left lumbar is. Tell me where the right hypochondria. But mostly I'll use the word, right? Like lumbar versus iliac versus hypochondria. Okay, so that's a that's neat reference and neat thing that you're definitely gonna need to know, especially clinically, uh, because that's actually how you speak to your medical professionals. I'm not gonna say, well, it hurt her tum tum here and around here, or hurt her hoo hoo or ha ha or whatever um, baby language you want to speak. But we speak medical terminology as medical terminology professionals. So if the if my patient is having some uh, GERD and so having some pain, um, most likely it's epigastric pain. If my patient is complaining of um, uh, McBurney's point or uh, like uh, pain typically associated with appendicitis. It starts out periumbilically and then, then it moves towards your right lumbar and even sometimes to your right, um, uh, your right inguinal area. 
O O R P U D R E Q U S is ultrasound. Of course, it's a machine that utilizes sound. Ultra, it's above our hearing. That's why the only thing you'll hear is the hum of the machine. And that's about it. Ascites is a generalized edema. This is not good. It uh, means uh, you either have heart or kidney failure. Um, ascites is edema or tissue swelling in um, mostly in your peritoneal or your, your abdominal cavity. Borgmerigmus, those are those gurgling sounds that you have. Uh, if you have too many of those sounds, that could uh, also signal dyspepsia. Or maybe you have IBD or IBS, you might have a decrease uh, number of sounds. And that's why when you go to GI Med, they're gonna put a stethoscope here on your belly and try to listen for some Borgmerigmus or uh, gurgling sounds. Cirrhosis is hardening of the uh, liver or the yellowing. Now it's hardening of the liver. They, we call it hardening of the liver because the, the yellow fat content of the liver, when damaged, it, it, turns, it turns hard. And then if it turns hard, then it, there's massive amounts of inflammation and the liver won't be doing its job. And the classic pres presentation is alcoholism, chronic alcoholism. Uh, diverticulum disease or diverticula, the out pouches here, right? Uh, they start becoming inflamed. And, and again, part and parcel of the IBD, IBS uh, series of, uh, of uh, diseases and disorders and pathologies. Dysentery, don't need to know. Fistula, abnormal connection from one organ to another. GERD, we already talked about. Hematochesia. Hematochesia is when uh, you pass bright red stools. That means um, the, the issue is a lower GI problem. But if you have melena, which is, um, let me get rid of this, dark, black, sticky, tar-like stools or feces, um, uh, that means you have an upper GI bleed, most likely in the stomach. Hernia is just a protrusion, anything sticking out that it shouldn't stick out. A hemorrhoid is something that you shouldn't stick out. But what actual is a hemorrhoid is not really a hernia or a herniated uh, rectum. It is actually varicose veins, uh, the veins all around the mucosal internal lining of your um, anus and um, rectum that gets enlarged, also known as piles. I don't know why they call it piles. Never understood that. Pancreatitis, peritonitis. Oh, the peritoneum is the covering of your intestines. So that's what we're really afraid of. Peritonitis and then, then the other sequelae of, um, of um, massive blood infection, which is sepsis. That's what we're really afraid of in appendicitis. I really, yes, appendix, your appendix uh, inflamed, it's hurt, it's painful, I am concerned. But I'm more concerned about if that thing bursts, all the, all the fecal matter that's gonna start floating around in your peritoneum. And then you get peritonitis. From peritonitis, because your peritoneum has lots of arteries and veins, you can go septic and that's never a good thing. Volvulus, that's when um, your bowel, starts, uh, because of uh, unchecked herniation, your bowel starts tangling up. That's never good. If I do a barium enema, I can do a barium swallow as well. Barium enema for, uh, for, uh, to enhance lower GI picture, barium swallow to enhance an upper GI picture. And you can see the difference. Barium enema that didn't take, nothing lights up. Barium enema that took, you can see everything. MRI, oh, we know what MRI is. Magnetic resonance imaging. That's when we use uh, electromagnetic energy um, to, and then there's a computer that takes that energy because essentially you're a big battery. You're a plus and a minus. And the MRI, the machine gets all the pluses and minuses excited to different levels. And then the computer picks it up and picks up that excitation or picks up that energy 
in the form of a picture. Stool guaiac, also known as a hemocult test, very common test because typically your poops, also known as your feces or stool, is like dark, dark brown. So it's really hard to see blood in it unless it's just outright bleeding, right, in hematochesia. But uh, typically there might be some hidden or hemocult, hidden blood, right, inside the stool. So we perform a stool guaiac test. Uh, laparotomy or a laparoscope. Um, if I do a laparotomy, I cut you up here and then we just look inside. Uh, we're not taking anything out. And same thing, um, uh, we perform a, a laparoscopic um, uh, surgeries now because all I need is like three holes in you versus one big huge cut here um, down the middle or down the side. Bariatric surgery. Now, what's bariatric medicine? Bariatric medicine deals with uh, morbidly obese people. Not obese like I am obese, like the kind of person who, you know, um, they, they, they can't walk, they can't get up and out of bed, They're, they have severe comorbidities, they have severe um, breathing issues, uh, severe skin problems, and watch that. And uh, bar bariatric surgery does all that stuff to deal with um, uh, morbid obesity. Now, uh, if you've watched My 600 Pound Life and um, those shows on TLC, um, you could see what they do. Um, they, they try to help patient because when, when it gets to that level, it gets the, 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 the health status of my patient gets very, very scary. Drugs and acid. Anti means against, so it's against acid. Anti-diarrhea, it's against diarrhea. Anti-emetic, it is against um, um, vomiting. Laxative, of course, uh, uh, relieves constipation. And all laxatives do is block your GI uh, water absorption in your large intestine. Most laxatives are made out of like some clay-like material just to gum you up so that you're, um, you can't absorb uh, water very well, well, temporarily. Now, what's an H2 blocker? Any H2 are receptors, and um, they're very common. Uh, maybe you heard of them, Zantac and Prilosec. Um, uh, they're to treat heartburn and peptic ulcers and GERD. And they block the histamine 2 receptor. That's what H2 means. Now, we'll talk about this next week. Uh, now, next week, of course, I won't have a lecture. I'll just have um, a pre-recorded uh, video lecture. And, but in that pre-recorded video lecture, I'm going to start talking about um, the progress notes or these cases um, at the end of your um, at the end of your chapters. Okay. All right. It is that time of the show where. Um, well, first, I'm 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 going to outline uh, the. Um, the exam and how is it going to go down and then I'm going to open the floor to questions. So like I stated earlier, the exam is going to be on the 10th and it's going to start at 6 p.m. promptly. Now you don't have to log into uh, Moodle, but you have to be able to log into your, um, what's it called? Uh, your, I mean, you don't have to log into Zoom, you have to log into Moodle and what will uh, what will you need to see on Moodle? I will put, of course, here in the announcement section. Now you, and then there'll be an exam. Inside it goes inside. It'll say, it'll say week five midterm exam. You open up the exam. It'll be in a Microsoft Word document. Now, then you email me the answers you'll have until 715, okay, which is more than enough time. On average, a 50 item multiple choice examination can be done in 38 minutes, okay? Please don't go that fast, but you know, uh, take your time. And when you answer via email or via, um, uh, you send a Microsoft Word document, I just need, just write down one through 10, I mean, not one through 10, one through 50, and then just type down, you know, your answers. I don't need to see the entire document all over again. 
Okay, so if I'm you, the night of the exam, right? I, I take my, you know, I make a little answer sheet on a Microsoft Word and then I put my answers, okay? And then of course, what do you put? You, in the header or whatever, or, uh, you put your student name, name of the course, uh, and the date. And the date for that would be November 10, 2020. And I need to see that email and I will open it up and then I'll be on, I'll be online uh, available to talk via Zoom or uh, you guys have my, have my cell phone as well if there's any technical difficulties. But at 7.15, I need to see everyone, uh, everyone's uh, answers because um, um, this is what happens at 7.15 for every minute uh, that there's no submission, um, I take off one point. So in the next 100 minutes, you could have no points. So um, now you could take the exam early, but you can't take it late because grades are due that week. Okay. And what will it be based on? It'll be based on two basic things. What are the word parts or what's the meaning of the word? So for example, what is uh, uh, the suffix of the medical term uh, dermatology? And then we'll be have like A would be, it goes, is it dermat? Is it O? Is it logi? Oopsies, I'm gonna give up. And again, for that particular number, let's call this number one you'll have a, a corresponding, you know, uh, Microsoft Word document that has, you know, one and then your answer. Fix this. Now that's one kind of question. Another kind of question is uh, the actual meaning. So which of the following is uh, the department that deals with your department? Uh, is it dermatology? Is it gastroenterology? Cardiology? Neurology. Right? And you could see from the, the practice uh, exam that I'm going to make available tonight, all of the all the questions can be broken down into these two things. And of course, I pick and choose. Um, um, words from each one of the each one of the uh, five chapters, and what are the chapters? Week one, it's chapter one and two. Right, chapter one were the basics of medical terminology. Chapter uh, chapter two was body structure, and I have. Um, uh, a video lecture on that as well. Week two, cardiovascular. Week three, respiratory system. And of course, today, which is week four, uh, we did gastrointestinal. So that's one, two, three, four, uh, oh, how, how many, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. So two chapters here and a chapter here, a chapter here, a chapter here. So that's five total chapters for uh, uh, that you'll be responsible for for next week's midterm. Does anyone have any questions on how this is going to go down? So is at this point where I'm